Eagle looking great, your go. Neil Armstrong is the pilot there. He's got to land this thing. Listen, babe, everything's going just swimming. They picked out a, a, a landing spot, and they thought they understood it pretty well. At the earth, right out our front window. But pretty quickly, Neil understands that there's stuff down here. There's a boulders the size of cars. There's craters the size of football fields. And Eagle Houston, we got data dropout. You still there's a lot of good. alarm bells going off. Program alarm. The lunar module itself was having computer problems. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. The reason for those computer problems was is it was working too hard. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. The astronauts had heard these things before. They understood what was happening. 1201 alarm. Same time for go flight. And finally, uh, ignoring all of the, the warnings and, and moving himself into a right place. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 42. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Neil is able to put that, uh, that vehicle down. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. The first tool astronauts would need when they stepped out of the lunar module. These are the original blueprints. You can see the different sections on this one. Came from these aging blueprints. Discolored with coffee stains, more than 50 years old. My name's Michael Ellis. Uh, my dad was Glenn Ellis. And uh, as an employee draftsman at Union Carbide at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 60s, in the late 60s, uh, he designed and drew the plans for the moon, what I call the moon scoop. Officially known as the contingency soil sampler, the moon scoop was the first tool astronaut Neil Armstrong needed once he stepped on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Everything that the astronauts had, at least when they first exited the module to step foot on the moon, had to be on their uniform. They couldn't carry anything. So we talked about the fact that it needed to be a shovel that could be folded up and put in a pocket. Uh, like a uh, powdered charcoal. They the, stuck uh, it out and got some soil samples just in case things went south and they had to leave the moon. They had at least put some soil. And it's just neat now to think back that Daddy was doing that. You know, you don't realize until you're grown. 22 years after his death, the Ellis family looks to his blueprints for a glimpse at his role in history. Photos of the moon landing hang in the foyer of his grandson's house. A thank you from NASA to the Lenore City draftsman. But their favorite story of the tool their grandfather designed is one that never should have happened. Uh, you might recognize what I have in my hand as the uh, for the Nearly two years after Armstrong first stepped foot on the moon, astronaut Alan Shepard was doing the same for Apollo 14. But he had a surprise no one saw coming. Shepard used the contingency sampler to rig up the galaxy's longest golf shot. And he had some help from other engineers and technicians so he wouldn't get detected. And when he got to the moon, he was able to attach the head of that six iron dropped two golf balls on the surface and hit both of them where he famously says miles and miles and miles. miles, and miles, and miles. The contingency sampler was used on most every mission to the moon. Luckily, it never had to be the sole source of samples. So NASA had another challenge. They needed something that would store and protect additional moon rocks. And they looked to Y-12 in Oak Ridge. Well, the people here in Oak Ridge that actually worked on the box knew the importance of what they were doing, and they were proud to be a part of a race to the moon. By the time Apollo 11 approached in the late 60s, Y-12 already had a growing relationship with NASA. During the Gemini project, there was Project Big, the blood in Gemini, where Y-12 came up with some sample containers to take blood samples into space to find out if being in a space environment would change the DNA of our blood. It made sense for NASA to approach Y-12 when looking for someone to design something that could safely store lunar samples. They dubbed it the Moon Box. The Moon Box was made out of a solid piece of aluminum. There were no seams, there were no welds, uh, which would make it more leak tight. There were four straps attached to the container to make sure that it didn't open. And it also had to be designed so that an astronaut could open and close it in a space suit with gloves. So it had to be pretty easy to open and close. At the American Museum of Science and Energy, there's one on display. Only this moon box never made it to the moon. 
Throughout the entire Apollo program, more than 16 did. There were a large number of people who did work on it. There was one who, uh, when he passed away, his one request was that, his moon, that the moon box be at his funeral because it was the thing that he was most proud of. As the Apollo program continued past the first moon landing, geologists grew frustrated that the samples in the moon boxes weren't clearly identified. So an engineer at Y-12 had an idea. They needed the small bags to isolate those different rocks and, and uh, they needed them made out of Teflon, but they also needed them to be certain size and made in a certain way. So Y-12 went to the knitting nook here in Oak Ridge and Lorraine Shook is the lady that actually did the knitting to make the Teflon bag. There's a shopping mall where the knitting nook once stood. And Lorraine Shook has since passed away. But her seemingly small contribution made it easier for geologists to study the moon's surface for decades to come. The Apollo program is the gift that keeps on giving. These 842 pounds of rocks are still being studied by new uh, technologies, new analytical technologies, and we keep learning new things that we, we didn't know uh, before. You won't get Hap McSween is a retired planetary science professor at the University of Tennessee. He studied rocks from several of the Apollo missions. The moon is geologically dead, so it gives us a picture of what happened uh, in the early solar system that we can't get by studying from our own planet. The more than 800 pounds of lunar samples would continue to amaze scientists for the next half a century. And as NASA looks to return to the moon and beyond in the next few years, they're once again looking to East Tennesseans to help with the journey.